Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Mark O'Toole. I'm a member of Eric Morrow & Associates Public Relations Practice. Thanks for joining us today. Our webinar is titled The One-Page Marketing Plan, where we will share information about success plans. We're really excited about this, and they prove it incredibly useful for our clients. Our presenters today are my colleague, Mary Wusu, our VP of Analytics and SEO, and Suzanne Diaz, Marketing Manager, North America for Kingspan Insulation. Mary created EMA's success plan framework to help companies tackle some of the largest marketing challenges, establishing clear goals for both campaigns and entire marketing programs, and then measuring them accurately. Suzanne oversees strategy implementation of marketing activities for Kingspan Insulation in the U.S. and Canada. If this is your first exposure to Eric Moore & Associates, we are a digitally integrated, independent marketing and public relations agency with about 200 professionals in five states and nine offices. Where are we? Well, we have five offices in New York. We're in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, and New York City. We're also in Cincinnati, Charlotte, Boston, and Atlanta. Uh, but our work is done for clients around the country and around the globe. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at Mower Agency. Uh, and for today's webinar, we're using the hashtag success plan. Follow along and, of course, feel free to contribute to the conversation. Mary and Suzanne will answer questions at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A module, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen, to ask questions. Take it away, Mary and Suzanne. Thank you so much, Mark. And hello, everyone. This is Mary Owusu speaking. As Mark said, I am a Vice President Overseeing Analytics and SEO here at Eric Moore & Associates. And my role really is to lead the strategic thinking around how we approach measurement for all the marketing activities that we engage in for our clients. And I'm joined today by my client-turned-friend, Suzanne Diaz from Kingspan. Uh, Suzanne, would you like to give a hello to the folks on the line? Sure, Mary. Hi, everyone. My name is Suzanne Diaz. I'm the Marketing Manager for North America in Kingspan's Insulation Division. Um, I've been in building supply for about 14 years, started working in kitchen appliances, then plumbing, and now insulation and moisture management products. So thanks, Suzanne. I know you all have busy days, so I'm very excited that you're able to join us today, and I promise you that it's going to be worth your while and it's going to be a fun hour. What I'd like to do is start off by level setting us on three things. The first is a definition, the second is a promise, and the third is a case study. So the definition. I'm sure you're here because you, you wanted to learn about success planning. So I'm going to let the cat out of the bag right off the bat and tell you exactly what a success plan is so that we're all on the same page right off the bat. So a success plan is a one-sheet measurement roadmap that's developed specifically for marketers and communication leaders who not only have to come up with the marketing plan or the communications plan, but then have to prove that it actually worked. And by the time we're finished with this webinar, not only will you know what a success plan is in and out, but you'll also have the opportunity to download a sample success plan to leverage for yourself. And that's the promise, that you'll walk away with something tangible that you can start using right away to inform the work that you do every day. Now the case study. Uh, rather than just talking about success planning, Suzanne and I are going to show it in action so that you can get a sense of how it really works and how it could be meaningful for you and your team. So if you're on board with those three things, let's get right in. Now, those of you who are familiar with Google's Think with Google blog site may have seen that last year, Google put out a series of articles related to the tumultuous relationship between marketing and measurement. You know, the article was riddled with a bunch of puns around how marketing and measurement are finally starting to put a ring on it after all these years of engagement. Um, and and it, it really kind of boiled down to one main thought, that ultimately, when the two things are actually aligned and working smoothly together, beautiful things can happen. And this article went on to say that, in fact, beautiful things are already happening between marketing and measurement. And the setup was this. 
So right now, if you put any group of marketers into a room, we all fall into two broad categories. Roughly 25% of us are considered leading marketers. We're the ones who are data-driven, right? We're looking at attribution models. We're trying to figure out how to track that single user. We might be the early adopters of tools that may be imperfect, but we just want to try to learn as much as we can about that single user. Now, on the contrary, 75% of us are called mainstream marketers. We're just as eager to learn those things. We just perhaps don't have the budget, the time, or we just may not be early adopters in general, and we want to wait and see what the next big solution really is before we jump on board. So this Google article that I'm referencing was taken uh, out of a, a research study that was done by Google and eConsultancy, which is a research company, I'm sure you're aware. And when they did this research study of top uh, marketing executives and asked them what they thought was the relationship between marketing KPIs and business goals, regardless of which bucket the marketers fell into, a resounding majority of them agreed with the statement that to truly matter, marketing KPIs must be tied to broader business goals. And if you're on the call right now and you're you know, nodding internally to yourself, that of course this is how you operate every day, well, you're among the majority because that is the way that we should be thinking as marketers, right? And actually, when you do successfully tie these two pieces together, the desired business outcome and your marketing KPIs, the results can be quite outstanding. Statistically, marketers who link marketing metrics to business results are actually two times more likely to significantly exceed business goals within their organization than their counterparts. Two times more likely. That is. That is significant, and not only are they moving the needle on some marketing KPI, they're moving the needle on a business objective that they set out to meet. So it may sound like, on the surface, marketers and, you know, regardless of which category you fall into, you know, we've sort of figured it out. As soon as we just figure out how to marry measurement and what we're doing with top-level business objectives, that we've got it golden. But the reality is, as the study continued and continued to ask these marketers more questions around, are there any barriers to effective measurement? You know, you want to get to that ultimate pie of reaching those business level metrics, but are there any barriers along the way? And what they found was that regardless of which bucket the marketers fell into, that they all agreed that they struggle with access to the data that they need. Right? They can't integrate it. They've got perhaps too much data to deal with or it just doesn't sync seamlessly with other systems that they have. Another 22% of the, the group said that they don't have the right tools or the right technology. Right? They don't even have maybe the CRM system that they need or whatever it might be, the analytics tool they need. And then another 26% of both groups said they struggle to get buy-in and support from executives. And this is really a problem, right? Because here we are with this high desire to measure what we're doing against business level objectives, but we're faced with some pretty significant uh, barriers. Some of these don't even really fall within the purview of marketing's responsibility. They might be IT related or customer service related, right? But yet and still they affect our day to day. We certainly have been talking to our clients for decades since our inception in 1968 and really learning how they approach problem solving. And I can tell you that our clients resonate with those sentiments that we just looked at. We also looked at another research piece. This is the CMO survey that comes out every year, twice a year actually. This one is commissioned by the American Marketing Association, by Duke University, and by Deloitte. And every year they ask just about the same questions. And here's one question for us to look at. They ask CMOs to what degree does the use of marketing analytics contribute to your company's performance? It's essentially asking the same question that the Google survey asked. And consistently over the last six years since 2012, when they've asked the same question, with one being doesn't contribute at all, seven being contributes very, very highly, the sentiment has remained largely unchanged, right? And it's also very mediocre. So, Without really digging too deeply, you can see right away that CMOs don't have strong confidence 
and the ability for the analytics that they're collecting to actually contribute to the company's performance. So of course, this group also asked those marketers, what factors are preventing your company from using more marketing analytics to inform business decisions? And the, the results were very similar to the other re report and actually very similar to what we hear all the time and similar to um, when Kingspan, uh, Suzanne's team and I started working together, right? You know, you might have data, but it's, it doesn't come when you need it or it's overly complex, data overload, right? Uh, maybe you've got some data, but you can't get to the insight. Too much of, too much data dump, not enough insight. And really important are the last two items here in that bar chart from this group, which is that they resonated with the other group when they said, you know, we lack the tools, we lack the resources, we lack the processes that we need to truly measure success through analytics. You know, what was really funny um, about this research was that it really spanned businesses of all sizes, of all sectors, of all budget types, and these sentiments resonated across the board. And I was talking to Suzanne about this, and she said these certainly definitely apply in your world too, right, Suzanne? Yeah, and I think as marketers, we know what we want to do and what we should do, but how do we communicate to the C-suite that there's a need to invest into a tool, right? So you need to tie it and the reasoning back to the business goals and how marketing can provide support on attaining those business goals. Um, I attend some of the B2B marketing uh, lunch and learns in my area, which I'm in Atlanta, and tools and budgets always come up. And naturally, the speakers at these events, they show the best practices. And then as a listener in the audience, you always think, well, how does that apply to me in my business? Or do I have these tools? Can I get them? Um, how much will my budget allow for? And there are always people in the audience who work for very large companies and corporations and have large budgets, but there's also people that put their hand up and say, well, you know, I work for a medium or smaller size firm, and how can I do this? Um, somehow mm -hmm. we all have to make it work. Yeah. And, you know, spoiler alert, I'll just say it right now, that success planning, the framework we're going to talk about, hits the nail on the head when it comes to this issue. And it, it sort of washes away the fact that we might all come from different sectors, have different budgets, et cetera, and just look at how in your specific situation you can still work toward that business level objective while removing those barriers that are in the way. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about exactly how that works. Before we get there, let me show you this next piece of, of insight that just came out last month. Gartner, Gartner for Marketers specifically, put out a CMO spend survey that concluded that after three consecutive years of increasing budgets, that most CMOs were reporting uh, a decline in budgets. And the reason for that was because the marketing field, these CMOs, um, were finding that they were becoming less able to really show that their work was driving business impact. To say it even more specifically, here's what the Gartner report says. It says, for most marketers, the inability to plan and proactively communicate the value of marketing investments up front makes future cost cutting more likely. And it went on to say this, that valuable marketing budget may be diverted to nurturing the wrong customers, right? So we're, we're in there, we're, we're doing what we can, but sometimes without really using that first party data that we have at our discretion in our systems, in our web analytics tools, et cetera, to understand the behaviors, the channels, and the product preferences of our most valuable customers, we're selling ourselves short and essentially targeting the wrong folks perhaps targeting the right folks with the wrong message, right? So this all culminates to why we developed this idea of the success plan framework. How do we overcome this budget problem? How do we overcome the barrier problem with having issues with data and tools and resources that may belong to another functional group? So success planning, right? It is a one sheet measurement roadmap, just as I said earlier. Um, oftentimes it's referred to as the one-page marketing plan, some people call it the marketing plan on steroids. But the idea here is that it's used by brands large and small 
to align the moving parts of any marketing campaign to the desired business level outcomes. And it does all that while identifying the technical, the operational, and the creative requirements that are necessary for the success of the campaign. And did I mention that it's a one-sheet document? <laughs> okay, that's what really makes it stand out. Besides that overarching description of what the success plan is, there are six main challenges that success planning framing solves for. Remember that challenge we just talked about around budget. Success planning, that process of going through it, it controls for diminishing marketing budget. It accounts for it. It defines what to measure and who is responsible for it. Right? A lot of times we will put in writing or maybe assign somebody uh, to do something, but without the accountability in writing um, and, and, the, and the reminders, it can fall through the cracks. Success planning doesn't let that happen. It establishes best-in-class KPIs up front so that you don't target the wrong KPI and, say, measure impressions um, when you should be measuring some other metric that is more meaningful to the C-suite. It also does something radical. It, it incentivizes the C-suite to remove barriers to marketing success. So said differently, it brings people to the table to talk about the challenges you're having so that they care, right? They've got skin in the game to be involved in removing those barriers for you because they can see how they don't gain when you don't gain. It fosters buy-in and collaboration across teams, and it also exposes any areas of risk to your plan before you spend any money. Now, the success plan does all of these six things I mentioned, and I should mention as well, although I said it's a document, what it's not is a fill-in-the-blank document that say you can just sit in your office and just kind of fill it out, although it is a fill-in-the-blank document. Rather, a better description of how it's activated is that it is, it is an engine for dialogue for all the folks who need to really be involved to make your project work. It is a planning document. It's a... It's an analytics um, metrics KPI document, and it's also a responsibility and accountability document. But it is one that only works when you engage folks up and down the ladder within your organization who are going to impact the success of your campaign. We're going to talk about Kingspan as the case study, as I said at the beginning, but I did want to start off by just quickly running down the nine factors of the success plan so you know what we're about to talk about. So success plans are nine factors. We develop them to be nine factors deep. The first four factors are very similar to a marketing plan, right? That's where you identify your objective, the business level objective that you're striving for, that you're solving for. You set your marketing goals, you identify your strategies and your tactics, right? These are all very familiar. Then the orange section of the success plan is where it pivots and becomes very much data-driven and very focused on analytics and measurement. How do we know that that upfront, all those elements are going to actually work? So here we start to talk about ideal KPIs, not the gut feel, not what we think, but what the industry best practice is for what you're trying to reach in terms of what your goal is. Uh, we set the KPI values. We identify the reporting tool, whether it exists or doesn't exist in your organization. And then lastly, it tackles the technical, the administrative, the creative, the technological issues or barriers that right now would impede you moving forward with your plan if they're not removed. So in, sh in just a summary, that's, those are the components of the success plan, all right? And I'll, I'll talk about one more thing, and then we're going to start walking through it. When does it happen? When are you supposed to use the success plan? Ideally, success planning happens early in the process before you actually go in market with whatever your campaign or project is. Now, success planning scales up and down. It can be used for websites. It can be used for small projects or for large IMC campaigns, right, integrated marketing campaigns. Um, Sometimes we have engaged success planning discussions middle, in the middle of, a, middle of a campaign or at the end of a campaign um, because that's what has to be done. Uh, but it works best when you set your KPIs up front because what success planning does at the beginning is it allows everybody who's involved in the conversation to agree on KPIs that are realistic. It allows you to implement all those technical and 
uh, operational requirements that needed to happen. And it also allows for alignment and collaboration with all the stakeholders who have a stake in, in the campaign. And I remember, Suzanne, when we first started working with Kingspan and we started talking about success planning, we had a meeting with just you to kind of walk through the draft that we had created based on our discovery session with you. And I remember there were like three, four times in the meeting when you had to get up and go grab your sales person or your customer service person because you wanted them to be a part of the discussion so much. Absolutely. I was very important for us to get everyone's buy-in at the same time. And um, I think we started and then um, I had put our managing director on notice that I might grab him um, and get him involved in the conversation, which we did. And then as we got deeper and deeper into the who, what, where, when, and how, I ran out and got somebody from technical and ran out and got somebody from sales. But again, it was really important for everybody to understand what we were trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was one of the most animated sessions we've ever had with success planning. But it was, it was really what needed to happen because we were asking challenging questions that really belonged to a different function or functional group. And we could have scheduled a follow-up session, but it was just handy that the group was there and available. So we took advantage of it. Right. Why don't we just very briefly talk about this idea of scalability, right? I mentioned the success plan scale. So, like I said, it can be used for a small project that maybe is a few months long, or it could be used for a three-year plan or anywhere in between, right, or anywhere higher, right? It's really meant to be just a facilitator of thinking and dialogue to make sure that you are dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's and involving the right folks. Here are some examples of how we've um, used the success planning across a number of clients of different sectors. Uh, we've got a national bank as a client who used success planning to determine the viability of expanding its services to a new demographic and uh, dem a new um, demographic of folks and also a new geography. We also used it for a global B2B health insurer. They were really keen on growing their market share, and also they needed to shift brand perception among their target audience, which was HR benefit administrators and, and HR brokers, benefit brokers. We've even used it for an international automotive corporation, and in that instance, we used it to forecast the effectiveness of an IMC campaign. And we've also used it for a regional visitor, a visitor's bureau. And in that case, we used it to define the success criteria for a new website because they really wanted to make sure that when the site went live, it didn't just look better, it actually performed better and, and met specific criteria at the business level. So it really scales in terms of the project that you've got, the sector you're in, the budget that you have. And of course, we've also used success planning for Kingspan. Yeah, if you're in the building supply or construction industry, uh, you might be familiar with our Green Guard brand here in the United States. Uh, but for those of you who are not, um, the Kingspan Group is a leading global manufacturer of high-performance insulation and building envelope solution products. Uh, the company was originally started in the 1960s in Ireland and has grown tremendously over the years uh, to a $3.8 billion firm. As you can see on the left there, we operate in five different divisions. Insulation panels, which are, if you go to an Audi dealership and you see the outside paneling or an Ikea, for example, um, that's what that particular division makes. Insulation boards, which is where I am, access floors, environmental, such as solar panels, and light and air. So overall, our we've improved building performance and reduced energy costs. We're very, uh, concerned about climate change and, and uh, the different environments that the buildings are in. So Kingspan on the right-hand side, you see our sales by uh, geography. and We're considered a super brand in the UK and very well known throughout Europe and Australia, but what about North America? Because that's where I sit. So insulated panels have been in the States for some time, but when we talk to our architectural community, which is the target audience we were trying to reach with this particular campaign about Kingspan, you know, everybody always assumed that we were talking about metal panels. But here we are from the insulation division. Um, 
trying to talk to them about something slightly different. So the challenge really was to grow brand awareness in the commercial building sector, as well as launch a new product in the United States. So that new product is called Coolzerm. And so what is Coolzerm? It's a premium performance insulation board that offers a very high R value per inch of thickness, more than any other commonly available insulation. So think of your basement, you know, or, or attic, and you have insulation in there. And this particular type of insulation offers the same thermal resistance, but in a thinner profile. So for architects and engineers, our target audience, that means more freedom in design, thinner walls that offer the same insulation value. For occupants in the building, it means more enriching natural light and also very important, more rentable and sellable space for the clients, the building owners. So CoolTherm had been available in Europe for yeah, over 20 years. But the challenge to, for us was that no one was familiar with it in the U.S. since we were bringing it to this market for the very first time. So we wanted to show architects and specifying engineers different case studies of prestigious projects around the world where this particular product had been used, stadiums, universities, and some of the buildings that you see here. So that was the challenge, and we enlisted Eric Mower and Associates to help us with this. So the first thing that we did was make sure that we understood the business level objective, right? Marketing planning 101. So in sitting with Suzanne and team, we made sure we understood that ultimately they want to launch the Kingspan and Cool Therm brands in the U.S. All right, that was clear. The next step was the goals, right? Goals, you guys know this probably already. But just for a refresher, goals are different from objectives because they tend to be more short run, they tend to be highly measurable, and marketing goals specifically, they fall within the purview of the marketing function. And so as we sat down to talk about helping them become a new entrance into the U.S. and, and, and competing on awareness with other brands already established, uh, it became clear that actually they were looking for more than awareness, right? The campaign was going to be very short. It was going to be four months. Um, and they certainly wanted awareness, and they wanted to generate interest. But the more we asked about, well, what does interest mean? And is it just somebody engaging with you on, say, a social network? Or does it go beyond that? Is it, is it more than that? Uh, the more we learned that actually what the group wanted was actually leads, right? So enter a new market, make a splash, get leads. And I always laugh with Suzanne because I don't think I have ever met any, any business that ever just wanted awareness for awareness sake. There's always kind right. of a side of lead. <laughs> um, so from a success planning perspective, we made sure we broke out uh, the awareness and interest and lead generation for the cool term product. And then also separate from that, we had the awareness and interest for the Kingspan installation brand. And as we talked to the target audiences, it was clear that the target audience was the same for, for both, uh, both marketing goals. Those percentages that you see at the bottom, the success plan has a role for a field called weighting, right, where you allocate a percentage weight to one goal over the other. And you really do this when you've got some history with one goal over the other and you know based on that historical information that one goal has a higher chance of moving the needle on the business objective than the other. So in that case, we would say, you know, if, if mid-campaign we have to make a call on budget or resources, uh, we're going to put all of the remaining budget on goal blank. You would have already determined that earlier on in the process with the key decision makers at the table. So the waiting role we find to be quite important uh, when we're doing success planning. And we talk you through that, of course. The next steps, the next two steps, are all about strategies and tactics, right, step three and four. So you know the strategies are, you know, what are we going to improve? What are we going to do differently? What are we going to reduce? And this is a brainstorming session. Uh, what we do is we come up with as many strategies as, as make sense for that goal, being careful not to only recommend strategies that King's Plan was already familiar with, uh, because it's our job as you're developing the success plan to think about best practice, right? What is the best practice KPI? What's the best practice tactic or strategy for that goal? as opposed to what do we have money for now, or what is it that we um, 
already have a partnership to do. You, you highlight the things that you need to have to be successful regardless of what the barriers are because the barriers will come later. So we talked about leveraging paid and earned media for awareness uh, sake. We talked about their other, they had another agency uh, that was a part of the conversation, so it was very collaborative. We talked about uh, them handling a lot of the search behaviors and the search projects, so they were going to make sure that CoolTherm was ranking for those related searches. And as well, we talked about, well, where are, where are people going to convert? Are we going to build a microsite? Is, are they just going to go to the Kingspan main parent page? And we agreed that there needed to be a landing page that would be that hub for education for all the engineers. And from a tactics perspective, we, like I said, come up with all the tactics that make sense for lead generation, the tactics that make sense for awareness, and then for interest. Again, no bias given, right? If King's Plan came to us for lead generation efforts and they had no email marketing in place, whether in-house or with somebody else, because email marketing is ideal for lead generation, we would recommend it as a part of success planning because it's what is right to do. And then we will talk about it in the later steps, what the barriers are to doing that, and then present that to the folks who are responsible for removing those barriers. That's how it works, right? So we talked through a lot of tactics. And I remember when we sat down with you, Suzanne, the continuing education courses was one that was really something you hadn't really thought of because we were talking about coming up with ideas for where your audience goes as opposed to where you were used to advertising. Right, and this slide really shows you some of the what, but I always like to get in and share a little bit about why and how. So uh, as Mary said, you know, it, it, to me it's all about meeting your audience where they are. So for example, with the continuing education courses, our target audience, architects, they have to complete X number of continuing education course hours in order to maintain their licensure. And so we worked with our technical team to create a, a generic course, which was sponsored by Kingspan, of course. But Eric Moore and Associates identified a media source that reached our audience with different educational opportunities, both in print and digital form. And that was very successful. And we continue to give the course even today. We've now even taken it to a new level of where we give it face to face. But uh, let me take you through a couple more tactic examples from this particular campaign. It was definitely a collaborative effort with the various media partners involved and um, two agencies for us from, from the Kingspan side. Here you see various email blasts and print ads that were used because for some publishers, uh, we found, and we'll share that with you in a little bit, we found that digital did better than print. And for other publications, print did very well as well with the lead gen. Um, also, the digital ads that were placed on relevant sites that we targeted for our audience was very important. And as I mentioned before, it was really crucial to show the architects and specifiers that even though cool therm insulation was new to the U.S. market, it had been used in many buildings around the world. So as you see there, one of the call to action items was to download an inspiration book. And this was a beautiful project book with incredible architectural photography and that showcased the various buildings and the benefits of cool therm insulation. So then we took it to the next level, I think, in PR, which now that I think about it, it seems like, oh, we should have done this. And, and you know, it really took um, some effort on everybody's part. but. What P, the PR team did of Eric Moore and Associates was to really help us move from being another advertiser for some of these media partners to being a true partner by building relationships with the editors. So, um, of course, we did press releases, but at the different trade shows, we got in front of these editors and we, we talked to them about not just our products, but trends and hot topics in, in the industry and what made sense for them and seeing if we could get them involved or um, tied to one of the subject matter experts in our organization. Yeah, you know, as you talk about the beautiful project book and all these things that had to happen to make the architect really be attracted to, to Kingspan and to Cool Therm, you know, from a measurement perspective, we just had to agree that those creative pieces had to be in print and that Kingspan had to be at trade shows, right? Those are typically hard to measure 
um, medium. And so it becomes very hard if, if, if we say, no, you must do things the way that is measurable, it doesn't really work for the target audience, right? And, and here's how it sort of unfolds in the success planning step five. So factors five, six, and seven, that's where the analytics piece comes in. And you probably will hear my voice take a, a higher pitch tone because I get excited about analytics and data. I, I'm a geek, I know. So what we do <laughs> is we take the marketing goal and we identify what the ideal KPIs are. See, we don't take the tactics and say, okay, you're going to do trade shows, you should expect this many people to come to your booth, and you're going to do print, you should expect this much circulation. No. Success planning with the directions that it gives and the directions that we're able to offer while we're part of it for you is we, we help you go back to that overarching business goal and say, for you to hit awareness metrics or success with awareness or success with interest or success with lead generation, these are the ideal KPIs for your situation based not on my gut feel but based on the best practice in the analytics discipline, right? So in the case of Kingspan, we talked about awareness for them being a longitudinal study, basically doing a post and pre-survey um, and asking folks, are they aware? Were they aware prior? You know, understanding how that lift happened. Uh, in the case of Kingspan, we didn't actually do that, although we recommended it because they knew they had no awareness in the U.S. market to start. So there wasn't really any need for that. Um, in other instances, we would recommend things like effective cost per impression as opposed to tracking impressions, which are really kind of useless. You know, what is the cost to me per impression by tactic, right? Things like that we discuss. But then at the interest level, what are people going to do to show that they are really interested and they're hearing the story, they're not just passing by it? So we would look at things like the case study downloads. We needed case studies on that landing page. We wanted to track like branded searches over time, Google Trends data. Are people talking now about cool term when they weren't in the past, right? Um, and then leads, information around how people are filling out the form on the website or even calling in and, and, and placing, uh, conversa having conversations with the sales reps. And I'll get a little bit ahead of myself here because it's important to mention that as we were planning, because the sales team was a part of the discussion, it was brought up that, as a matter of fact, they do field a lot of calls from folks and they do tend to be warmer. So we talked specifically about having a trackable phone number just for this campaign to make sure that those calls were separated from whatever calls the sales folks were already getting and that we could have those insights to share with uh, Suzanne and team once we went live with the campaign. So then what we do also at the KPI level is we segment. We identify what, how we're going to slice those KPIs. And in this case, we talked about geography and tactic, and I'll show you how that really plays out um, of the KPI value factor, which is factor six. So here you say, what's the best way to slice the information so that it's most meaningful to what the Kingspan team wants to do? So again, we slice it by geography and tactics. So at the KPI values level, we're saying, this is what we expect in terms of actual KPI values for segment A and then for segment B, segment A being geography. And without getting into all the details about how this is all calculated, we typically will use historical data to calculate how much we expect the audience to be. And where there's no historical data, we'll look at similar, look-alike data, uh, or we'll look at industry benchmarks. But regardless of where we find the information, we will put rationale in the success plan so that whether it's six months from now or next week, if we have to be reminded of why we thought we could get 4,000 visitors and a 2% conversion rate, that we're reminded as to where we pulled that data from. So all that lives in the success plan. Then factor seven is the reporting tool, right? So we know the KPI, we know the KPI target. Now which tool will that KPI live in? Is it going to be in Google Analytics or Adobe Analytics or is it going to be in a CRM system? And what report are we specifically going to pull and who is responsible for pulling that? In some cases, we even put cadence here. And we say, how frequently does that report need to be pulled? And that comes out of conversations with folks at the table based on how frequently they're meeting with their teams as well. And I remember when we started with you, Suzanne, you didn't have a CRM system yet in place, but you were working on one, right? Correct, yeah. When we first started uh, talking, we were putting the framework together for our CRM system. And 
also identifying which marketing automation platforms and tools would integrate with that CRM system. Um, I think, you know, it, it is a challenge for us as a company who doesn't sell online, for example, to tie exact marketing activities to sales, but we're putting tools in place now um, to try and do that. Plus, our sales cycle can yeah, be quite have... long in the construction industry. That's what I was just going to say. I know you've got those long sales cycles. Um, and even more reason to have brought all of those internal, you know, functional group leaders to the conversation, even those that didn't make it that day, but that you followed up with. Because as you start to then uncover uh, factors eight and nine, which are the last two factors of the success plan, you start to say, well, what are the technical requirements I need? This is where you would put things like the successful implementation of a CRM system, right? And if it's if, if it's if you can put a date, put a date. If you can put a responsible person, we encourage it. You might talk about you know needing that trackable phone number, right? All those things that you uncovered as you were planning the tactics and as you were setting the KPIs, they have a place to live in the success plan and a person responsible or an agency responsible to make sure that it gets done. And because it's a one sheet executive format piece of paper, it travels very easily. If you have to go to a C-level, a C-suite conversation or meeting, or if you are a part of a C-suite and you just have to present it, uh, you've got this one sheeter that you can send ahead of time or easily go through uh, in that session with cells highlighted of, of the areas that are the most critical because they are the areas that show gaps. Right? So those creative as well as those technical implications that we just talked about, those wrap up the success plan and really make it unique from any other measurement plan. Um, 149 lead forms generated, 66 phone calls over a short time frame again for this. And the conversion rate was 4%. We estimated 2%. So really strong results here uh, as well, those 408 folks who ended up signing up for the tech course. And we never shy away from also reporting on quantitative metrics as well, uh, including this quotation from another division uh, that I sent an email to Suzanne saying, hey, you guys over there in the installation are killing it. We're seeing your ads everywhere. Great work over there. <laughs> Yeah, that certainly made my day when I got that email. Um, you know, there was more interaction than that. The phone calls you see there, the 66 phone calls, um, it's interesting because we saw a spike in our phone calls about cool therm insulation every time a publication sent out an e-blast. And I had one of our salespeople running into my office and also our receptionist would say, hey, did one of those e-blasts go out again? Because we're starting to get phone calls, so it was great that we were able to track those phone calls. And the other thing that, as I mentioned before, we were targeting specifically the United States. And with the analytics that were in place and the plan that was in place, we were able to see the exact area codes where the phones came, uh, phone calls came in from and also that 95% of the leads were based in the U.S. And that was very important to us with the geo-targeting that we were doing. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would like to share with you was the analytics part of this, which I know Mary gets so excited about. She said she was geeking out. I also geek out about this stuff because as a marketer, this is very important for me as I go to my next planning stage, right? As you can see here, there's various publishers with different type of newsletters, and you can see on the delivered, the clicks, the cost per click, okay, well, Publisher A did well with this particular one. Publisher B did well with this particular one. But now as I'm planning for this year, our goals are a little bit different. And I can see, okay, well, if I want to get X number of leads, I might go with Publisher A on their e-newsletter. Or if I'm looking for uh, more awareness, I might go with Publisher A on a project e-newsletter. So this is very helpful for me now having gone through the success planning before to actually plan for my next campaign. Well, I think the key there is because we talked through what was important to you from a segmentation perspective, we were able to actually tag so that we could report on each of those very 
um, important details around, you know, which publisher, with which newsletter, with what creative, et cetera. And on the back end, in the analytics side of things, we could also see beyond those, those uh, traffic uh, figures that the publishers would send over and actually be able to track which publication, which channel, even print, as you can see down below where it says three, that row, and it says print. We could see how each channel actually contributed to the leads and to those phone calls that you saw two, two slides ago, those 66 phone calls that we tracked and we knew exactly who was calling. Those were fed into the CRM system. We could track the, the source that brought that in. And everything was measurable because we thought of it early and not later, right? And so four months later, when Kingspan was ready to make decisions about how to go to market with, public, with the next uh, campaign, it was so easy to make the decision because the data was available and it was meaningful and it moved the business. So we're going to end with this. Remember those barriers we talked about to measurement, right? Here you are trying to do the right thing, but you've got these challenges along the way. Everybody has them. You know, you're not alone in this. Just know that with this framework, what we've tried to do is to lift that off the marketer's shoulder as much as possible. If you're a communications leader and not necessarily a marketer, the same applies, right? We've lifted it off your shoulders so that you can successfully meet the objectives you're trying to meet because you're having conversations with the folks who should care about removing those barriers and you're telling them why that is important. So remember we talked about how marketers who link marketing metrics to business results are two times more likely to significantly exceed their business goals? Well, that, that study also found another very significant statistic that actually marketers who link marketing metrics to business results are also two times more likely to say that they have a powerful role at setting corporate strategy. And honestly, we think that's the best place that marketers should be, right? To, to be at a point where you are doing so well with your results and you're involving the right folks so much that you are now a part of setting corporate strategy and steering the organization as a whole. So what we'd like to wrap with is that really we think that the way that you achieve success really relies on how you define it. And so, you know, over the last 15 years or so, the digital revolution has really expanded the responsibilities that we have as marketers, and it's really resulted in a change of the status that we play. And so, for most organizations, measurement has become a headwind, and we've relied traditionally on arcane metrics that didn't really resonate with the C-suite. So a measurement approach, like what we've created here, we think centers on the business outcomes and helps marketers to become more central in the decisions that steer the organization as a whole. As I promised, a copy of the success plan is available for you to download. Just go to more.com slash success plan and get your copy. And if you have any questions, contact us. You can find us on Twitter, on, on email, and you'll find some contact information right there in that success plan document as well. Great. Thanks, Mary and Suzanne. Let's get to questions. We have a few in the queue, um, and attendees, please feel free to add any additional ones. First question is, it's always about money. How much does this cost? <laughs> well, you'll be happy to know success planning scales, like I said, right? So, um, so depending on what it is that we're trying to help you solve. Is it a big, broad IMC plan with multiple folks with travel time and that sort of thing? Obviously, that would be more expensive. Um, but we've seen folks uh, do success plans for low four digits, right? So, you know, low like two, three grand range for their project. Um, and we've seen it higher than that in the five-digit range as well, uh, you know, in the teens for some folks. So if that gives you an idea of a range, uh, if you have a specific project you want to talk about, we'll be happy to chat with you and give you something more specific. Great question. Great. Um, next question, and maybe we get uh, perspective from both, both Mary and Suzanne on this. How long does it take to develop a success plan? That is another scale question. Um, we have been able to execute success plans in roughly a week and a half, right? Typically, we 
we sit with you, we ask a lot of questions, we do discovery with you to understand your business and your goals and really pinpoint what you're trying to do in the near term. Um, and then we will work on a draft of a success plan. And then we'll bring it to you, you as the lead person. And then once you've had a chance to make inputs, we typically will follow your lead as to who else within your organization you feel needs to be a part of the process and we'll have subsequent meetings. But we've been able to turn the whole thing around in a week just because there were less people involved. Um, and there have been cases where we've gone through the success planning process for six weeks. So it really depends on all the factors and all the people who have to be a part of the decision. Suzanne, how long did it take about, your team? Yeah, I think it was about four weeks or so, Mary. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, like I, I said right. in the beginning, we, yeah, we were able to um, – be all in there on a day that uh, several key players happened to be in the office. So that's why I mentioned before I, I ran out and I, I got those people um, in on it. But I think what's really important to note is, you know, this is not something that you do and you forget about. This is something that you continue to come back to and come back to and double check and make sure that the results that you're starting to see as time goes on with the campaign or with whatever you're planning um, that it ties back to those goals. And I think that's a very important thing to note. Great. Um, and I suppose also both from the agency perspective and, and the, the client perspective, who leads an effort like this? Who mm -hmm. facilitates it? Yeah. So that's another good one. So. We typically will advise that whoever is tasked with this project on the client side would obviously be the lead on the client side. So in, the, in Suzanne's case, she was the lead on the client side. Um, on the agency side, the analytics team leads this. Um, we typically engage with our insights group, that's our research and, and account strategic planning team that will oftentimes facilitate the discovery session to make sure that they are really asking all those questions around target audience, et cetera. Sometimes that's the case. Other times, the analytics folks uh, run with the whole thing, just understanding what it is that we're trying to shoot for. So the lead on our side is analytics. The lead on the client side is whoever has a bogey on their head to you know, solve some complicated marketing problem and came to us for help. Great. Suzanne, any um, additional team members from, from your side that came into the equation that might not normally be part of something like this? Well, I think what's, what's interesting about Kingspan is that we have an all-hands presentation every month. And so when we do this, we have everybody from every department, it doesn't matter what function you, uh, you, you perform, call into this. Our managing director goes uh, goals for the year and how different departments play into that. And so when we talk about these kind of goals and success plan, um, you know, we put that in, in a presentation like that and we explain to everybody, okay, this is why we're doing what we're doing. So um, as I mentioned, you know, in the initial planning phase, we were lucky enough to get everybody in that room. But um, I think overall communication straight through to your customer service team, you know, whoever is on the phone, um, they have to know what's going on so that if they do get calls, they know why and they know what your audience is seeing out there and how to answer the questions. Yeah. And I'll just add that the reason why the analytics team leads this is because of the, of the really critical analytics component that you saw lives right in the middle of this. Right? You never want to just kind of guess at a KPI or say, I, I think that one is good enough. There are some best practice KPIs based on your goals, based on you know, awareness versus lead gen versus demand gen versus product sales versus whatever else it might be. So uh, you, you don't want to guess at something and, and be optimizing for a metric that might be subpar, especially in a competitive market. Right? So you want to do the right thing off the bat, and, and that's, that's what our role is, to make sure that you're measuring the ideal metrics that really are meaningful for the task at hand. Excellent. Well, thank you both, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today.
That's the end of our questions. We'll post this webinar to our website, www.moa.com, and we'll share a link to it shortly. Uh, Mary and Suzanne, any final thoughts as we wrap up? Yeah, I'll just say thanks, everyone, for making the time to join today. Um, as I promised, you know, that link is available for you to download a copy. We do frequently update it just based on things that we're learning. So um, when you go and you put in your information and you get to download a copy, just know that when new ones come up, we'll make sure to let you know to go ahead and, and get a new version so you're up to date. And thank you so much for joining us today. All right, thanks everybody. That's the end of our webinar.